This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. What I'm going to present today, it's um, kind of like, uh, I, I would like a, a lot of feedback on this project because it's in its very early stages. And uh, I've been working together with my colleague Javier Duran from Universidad de Los Andes in Colombia on this project in which uh, we're trying to study several aspects around the concept of economic imperialism by taking into account a particular case that is the one I will talk about here uh, related to the loss of uh, Panama from Colombia, the role of the United States in this uh, loss of uh, this, uh, this uh, previously uh, previous uh, Colombian uh, province and the role of uh, multinational corporations here. So um, let me start with a few questions that oops, that, uh, that drove uh, our, our research here. First of all, uh, there's a lot of, um, of talk about the role played by economic powers at financing or at giving uh, different kinds of aid to the corporations of their countries when expanding abroad. So there's, a, and I will uh, uh, talk a little bit uh, uh, about uh, different views that have tried to interpret or to understand why governments uh, might uh, put money in the behind the operations of multinationals from their own countries. Now, of course, there's a big debate of who benefits and who loses from this expansion of corporations abroad and from the role played by governments in, in, this, uh, in these expansions, and also what type of responses from uh, the countries that are colonized, uh, for the lack of a better word here, although if you guys have any uh, suggestion, I would welcome it here, uh, what kind of responses the colonized countries can develop, what kind of strategies they can develop when uh, facing imperial actions from, uh, from economic powers. This uh, uh, these uh, questions fall within the larger, the larger research agenda I've been developing in, in the last uh, few years regarding multinational corporations in poor countries. Basically, uh, we know that there's a lot of literature talking about the evils and the motives uh, behind this, but uh, there are several aspects here that can be can be requestioned here. So let me start with the with some of the. Um, of the roots of the explanation of uh, the effects and the motives of uh, the expansion of multinational corporations abroad. Maybe the most, uh, the classic one, I mean, that uh, became the root of a whole school of thought around multinational corporations is the one developed by Vladimir Lenin in 1917, where he basically um, decided to go beyond what Marx had said before. Marx, basically Lenin said, okay, Marx, Marx's interpretation of imperialism was one in which uh, Marx assumed that the world powers, world economic powers, expanded abroad in the search for markets. Now, Lenin said, Marx was right in his times, but he's wrong now. And uh, the now time was 1917. Now, Lenin said, the reason why Marx is wrong, uh, or, or the, Marxist, the, the, the traditional Marxist interpretation is wrong, is because now we, uh, by the time he was studying, he said, we see the role of multinational corporations expanding around the world, not in the quest of markets, but in the quest of resources. And more importantly, he said, the force behind this expansion is financial capital. We cannot understand globalization without understanding financial capital that has captured the governments of the, of the countries in which these companies uh, come from. Then we know later on, decades uh, afterwards, the people who came up with the dependency theory, people like, for example, Teotonio dos Santos, developed, uh, helped to develop the model, the center periphery model, in which multinational corporations played a role at, uh, at uh, not only expanding markets and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, looking for natural resources, but at creating, uh, at perpetuating the state of underdevelopment of some nations so that the rich nations could benefit from this inequality. And now, I mean, later on, we have people like Immanuel Wallerstein uh, developing this model even further by talking about the world systems uh, analysis. Now, uh, there have been some re recent uh, 
views about the expansion of capital around the world. And uh, we know that uh, um, some, uh, some recent scholars have tried to test what people like Lenin and, or, or, or Dos Santos said in the past. We have from 1993, Kane and Hopkins explained the, the expansion of, uh, of uh, multinational corporations abroad and the support of, by governments behind their, this expansion on the search of, uh, of uh, of new of new markets, uh, Noel Maurer, who is at Harvard Business School right now, and uh, Carlos Yu uh, wrote in uh, in uh, have written several studies. But basically, they said uh, governments will support the expansion of multinational corporations in other countries as long as they calculate social positive social benefits for their own nations. I mean, basically, they find a problem with the classic Leninist interpretation of a uh, constant support of uh, governments and the financial sector of, uh, of uh, the expansion of multinationals. And they find sometimes, well, the agendas uh, of uh, governments and uh, multinationals in their, in their own countries clash, which is something that, uh, well, I didn't want to put myself here, I mean, but, uh, but that I have found also in the studies of uh, United Fruit that I have, uh, that I have, um, that I have um, uh, developed late lately. Now, uh, in a more uh, uh, economically oriented study uh, published in the American e Economic Review, Berger and um, several co-authors uh, decided to study again, okay, what is the real effect of imperialism? And uh, they decided to take what they consider what is the quintessential example of imperialistic action in other countries, which is, in, in their viewpoint, the intervention by the US government in Chile in 1973 in order to overthrow the government of Salvador Allende. They claim, look, I mean, a, a government should do that, I mean, should uh, support its corporations in their political actions abroad as long as this creates new markets for the for 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 exports of uh, of the uh, of um of, of their own industry. And well, they argued that the Chilean case shows that eventually the American uh, economy benefited from this uh, from this uh, from this um, action. Now, uh, what happens in the places where these multinationals are expanding and uh, where these actions are taking place. Uh, there are uh, some uh, recent studies that, I mean, there, there's a whole debate around this. And uh, this is something I'm going to just mention uh, very briefly, uh, some, uh, some, um, some ideas behind this. Of course, the classics, uh, uh, I mean, the classic study by Lenin assumes a completely a negative effect on, uh, on the colonized countries as well as the, as, the, as the classic dependency scholars. Now, more recent studies, the latest book by Luis Bertola and Jose Antonio Campo uh, have, uh, has uh, uh, argued again a negative, uh, a negative effect of the actions of the, of the empires on the countries that receive these actions. Now we have uh, more rec other studies that basically say, well, actions by, uh, by, uh, by an empire on a colonized country uh, will have negative or positive effects depending on the institutional framework existing in the country that receives this uh, multinational capital or that receives these uh, this, uh, actions by the, by the, by the empires. And uh, some people we know uh, more recently also, people like Neil Ferguson have argued sometimes actually the empire can bring certain uh, set of institutions and certain set of, uh, I mean, like legislation and uh, stuff like that that basically can even be positive for the countries that receive these uh, kinds of actions. On the side of uh, business historical studies, Stephanie Decker from Aston Business School have uh, studied the, the actions of multinational corporations in Africa and uh, basic and the, the subsequent um, expropriation of these corporations. Basically, she says, um, Depending on the ability of uh, of the locals to take over the the businesses of the imperialistic powers, the effects will be 
positive or negative. If they are good at, at running whatever business the empire developed uh, originally, well, they will benefit. If they are not, the, the effect will be, will be negative. I, I know I'm summarizing, hopefully in a not very simplistic way, a wide body of literature, but basically I'm trying to put here uh, the, the study we're developing are, I mean, uh, in the context of these, uh, of these debates. The traditionally assumed negative effect of imperialistic actions uh, in, in contrast to other studies that have, uh, that have said, okay, it depends on many, on many factors. However, there's not much being said about actions from the colonized countries towards the empire. I mean, basically, the strategies developed by these colonized countries in, the, uh, 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 in order to respond to, to these imperialistic actions, particularly actions by the colonized country that take place within the empire. So this is what we are going to talk about, that sometimes the colonized country can respond uh, to actions taken by the empire by taking advantage of some particular characteristics existing within the empire. So this is the general framework that I hope I did not uh, flood too much, uh, too many names here, uh, in my in my in my talk. So the the case that I'm going to talk about here that we are working on with uh, my co-author are the reparations the American government paid in 1921 to the government of Colombia over the loss of, uh, of, um, of Panama. Basically, uh, here we know that the Panama Canal originally, the one, I mean, Panama used to be a Colombian province, and it was a group of uh, French entrepreneurs who wanted to develop the canal uh, they failed, and uh, this is one of the shares of this uh, company that originally tried to to um, to develop this uh, canal. Now, uh, the events taking place in Colombia uh, need to be studied uh, within the context of the expansion of the U.S. and the consolidation of the U.S. as a world power in this period, and the conflicts it had with the empire that was losing its power in the region, uh, which is a case of uh, Great Britain. Uh, here I'm going to just uh, make a long story super short, but basically uh, the dates that, uh, that um, a, a crucial date um, uh, for us to understand the expansion of the, of the United States is the 1848 war against uh, Mexico, the, which the Americans won, and uh, this permitted the expansion towards the west of the, of the, of the, of the United States. With the U.S. covering uh, the North American continent from the Pacific to the Atlantic, in 1855, uh, the American, several American companies uh, tried to build a, um, a, build a, a, um, a, a railroad in in the area of uh, Panama, in order to avoid um, to avoid, I mean, crossing the the whole the whole the whole the whole railroad, uh, the whole continent. I'm sorry. And uh, then the 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 oops, it, this is not 1899. I'm sorry. Um, the, um, then later on, the Colombian government gave a concession to per, to for to to build a to build a, a railroad a railway in the, to build a canal in in, in Panama. And well, this is 1889. I'm sorry. Uh, the the with the triumph of the United States over Spain, and the Spanish loss of the Philippines, Cuba, Puerto Rico, uh, the, the 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 United States consolidates its uh, its uh, its role as a I mean its its position in the world as an economic power. Now let's look at uh, Colombia very briefly here and the evolution the map of this country has had in the last uh, century. This is a map of Colombia in the year of 1900. Uh, as you see, much uh, bigger. I mean, there is a whole chunk of land here uh, being lost in different, uh, in different ways. And Panama, as we see here, was another, another province of Colombia until the year of 1903. So Colombia had actually 
bordered uh, Costa Rica, and uh, and uh, it was divided in a much smaller number of uh, of uh, political units. But we see the the change, kind of like the the, the shrinking of the of the size of the national territory being the loss of panama the one that has been more uh, more important not only for the imaginary of that country but uh, politically and economically in those times that was uh, a crucial a crucial event uh, Colombia, by the late 19th century and early 20th century, was an extremely chaotic country, economically speaking, politically speaking, uh, internal conflicts that uh, were destroying the country. And this, of course, uh, created um, um, the conditions, good conditions, for, for the eventual separation uh, of, uh, of Panama. Now, uh, before Panama um, separated, the, the U.S. and Colombia uh, signed a treaty, which is this Iran Hay Treaty, in which the U.S. Uh, negotiated a concession over the piece of land in which the Panama Canal would be built. And the U.S. would give Colombia $10 million plus $250,000 per year uh, for for a period of 30 years for the for the operation and the construction of this uh, Panama Panama uh, Panama Canal. Now, the Americans, uh, I mean the negotiators, reached this agreement, but of course the agreement needed to be ratified by the Colombian Congress, and the Colombian Congress rejected the the treaty. I mean, uh, there was a lot of uh, particularly patriotic uh, discussions about kind of like uh, what kind of control the Americans were going to have over 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 Colombian territory, etc. And just a year after, I mean, right after the moment in which the Colombian Congress rejects this treaty, the Americans support a separatist movement in Panama and Panama becomes an independent country, which we know later on would give the US the, the, the control over the area where the canal was, construct, uh, was built. So uh, here, I mean, uh, we have uh, this uh, cartoon in the Harper's Weekly in that, uh, in that time, we have a uh, Teddy Roosevelt with a bag. It says here, for those who cannot see from the distance, it says millions for a canal, and Colombia is represented by this uh, by this guy with the two guns. And uh, well, it says basically held up the wrong man. Basically, okay, the Colombians wanted to to tell the Americans, okay, we don't like your offer, and they were punished immediately by losing the whole the whole the whole thing. Uh, this is uh, just wanted to show you another couple of. Uh, um, cartoons from the era about uh, about the loss of uh, Panama. Here, this uh, this is uh, Roosevelt, the president of the U.S. GOP, the Republican Party, represented by this uh, by this uh, by this elephant. And well, it says Panama or bust. And here it says international law treaty. And uh, basically going over the international law, the treaty, Colombian protests, president, and he's kind of like showing Roosevelt as uh, a guy who did not really care about. Uh, the president or the elements in international law. And uh, the last one I wanted to show you before I continue here is uh, Roosevelt opening the canal and he's throwing the dirt over Bogota, the capital city of uh, Colombia. Kind of like uh, I'm even burying you here uh, for, uh, uh, after, after this. So this is something that, uh, that uh, had enormous repercussions later on in Colombia. I mean, several authors have said one of the reasons why Colombia is such a centralized country is because after the loss of Panama, many governments thought if we allow the provinces to be relatively independent, well, we will see this. I mean, other countries will just come and grab them or they will go and uh, go their own way. And, uh, and, uh, and this is something that, uh, that led, I mean, to, uh, to, to, to this, uh, to, I mean, partially led to uh, an, an extremely central, centralized political system in that, uh, in that country. So the U.S. unquestionably won. 
I mean, there was some little ship that tried to go to Panama to defend national sovereignty, whatever. It was a joke. I mean, it basically, this was an overwhelmingly uh, successful action by the U.S. and which showed a very strong weakness by the Colombians who just basically watched the part of their territory being lost. Now, okay. You win, you're big, you're the US, you're powerful, you're weak, you're small, you're poor, you're Colombia. So we have these extremely uh, divergent uh, actors uh, uh, playing in this, uh, in this uh, playing, playing a role in this, in this whole process. But years later, almost two decades later, by the year of 1921, <coughs> we see the American government paying $25 million of reparations for the loss of Panama. So here the question would be, OK, why, if I'm big and powerful, I mean, wh why do I show regret for what I did to begin with? I mean, this would be kind of like showing, OK, uh, saying I'm sorry, here's your $25 million, and, uh, and we get uh, this whole thing settled. Uh, here, uh, we need to talk about several, several issues that uh, were present around the whole loss of, uh, of, the, of the, I mean, the whole payment of reparations for the loss of Panama. The first one is the developments, uh, different developments in the international oil industry. Certain, certain characteristics of the way oil is exploited in Colombia, and the negotiations uh, between oil multinationals and the Colombian government. So let me put this in, um, I hope, yeah, it can be clear here. OK, well, this is, uh, well, a map before the whole chopping of the territory. Uh, but uh, here we have uh, Panama. Uh, and we have two oil regions here, the Middle Magdalena oil region and the Caribbean coast oil regions, regions that started being um, discovered and, uh, and developed in the early 20th century, mostly in the very beginning by Colombian corporations that, uh, that started exploring uh, the oil in the, in the area. Actually, one of the most uh, um, interesting characters behind this uh, exploration was a guy who wanted to be known as an oil man, but unfortunately for him, but maybe fortunately for everyone else, he's more well known for his literary works, is Jorge Isaacs, who actually the one who wrote this novel Maria that is now, I mean, every school boy, in, school person in Colombia has to read. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he was one of the entrepreneurs looking for oil here. But of course, we know oil is a very complex industry that requires a lot of capital technology that uh, these uh, Colombian entrepreneurs did not, uh, did not, uh, did not have. Now, uh, so there's oil here. And there's Panama, and there's the canal, and in theory, there are two separate, uh, separate things. Now, right after Panama gains its independence, the US government actually approached Colombia and said, let's try to get this settled, and uh, let's try to get it uh, um, officialized. In a way, nobody questions the sovereignty of uh, Panama, Panama in the in the future. So, in the year of 1909, uh, there's this treaty, the Ruth Cortez Treaty, uh, by which the U.S. government uh, proposes to pay 2.5 million dollars to get the whole thing settled and forget about this. But just one year later, we start seeing serious explorations for oil in the Magdalena region. So this is a moment in which Colombia starts becoming important. I mean, it was important before the loss of Panama because of Panama. And uh, well, once Panama was gone, then the country starts getting important again for different, uh, for different people. Uh, because of its soil potential. Now, 
I need to emphasize this was a potential. There was a lot of talk, people saying, oh my God, this country might be kind of like uh, the center of oil production in, in the Americas. And there was a lot of speculation around that. And that is why many people started going to Colombia just to buy land because they did not, uh, they did not know uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what what's going on here. The year of 1913, we start seeing Okay, those interested in, those oil, in that oil going to Colombia. And we see particularly British investors going into that country in the, with the, with the, um, behind uh, this firm Pearson and Son that had already uh, started oil activities in Mexico. And Pearson and Son became the main oil producer for some time in, uh, in Mexico and was looking for, for activities in Colombia. Pearson was super powerful in Mexico. And uh, well, it started, uh, it started going to Colombia also to look for, to look for possibilities and started negotiating uh, with the Colombian government. Now, the British are beginning to offer the Colombians, okay, I'm going to give you basically better conditions that most multinationals offer you. And uh, this was, uh, and uh, while the British were there, American negotiators arrived to Colombia. And here we start seeing a competition for this uh, Colombian oil. Uh, in the year of 1913, uh, um, and uh, there were two informal offers, I mean, kind of like under the table, of 10 or $20 million. But basically, this was to avoid the Colombians giving the con oil concessions to the British. And this is something that the Colombian government realized uh, soon enough. Okay. They, they were aware that they were weak, that they were poor, that they needed the capital, but there were two big guys trying to compete for their, for their, for their oil. And uh, uh, at some point, I studied in detail the negotiations between Pearson and the Colombian government. And uh, there is a very interesting process by which the Colombians were kind of like procrastinating any agreement with Pearson, partially while checking what the Americans had to offer. But at the same time, they, they, they were, I mean, uh, the anti-American feelings in Colombia were really, really strong in these times because Panama had just been lost uh, a little bit uh, around, uh, around, uh, around a decade before. Then the British lose the negotiations. At some point, the, Briti the British negotiators realized they were being used uh, as a pawn, as they themselves said, rather than um, being taken seriously in the negotiations and walk away from, the, from, the, from, the from, from these negotiations. And this led, in the year of 1914, to the treaty uh, to this um, Urrutia Thompson Treaty, by which the American government would give, uh, would offer uh, Colombia $25 million for, to settle the whole uh, Panama issue. Now, there is a problem here. I mean, one thing is to tell the Colombians, I'm giving you $25 million, but you need to convince the American Congress to give those $25 million. And this was, in a way, one of the hard, uh, hard, uh, hard elements here. Now, oil is still here in the picture. And one thing, again, is to sign a treaty, but it needs to be ratified by the chambers of both countries. And this is where we start seeing uh, interesting uh, developments. Um, in the year of 1919, an American corporation called the Tropical Oil Company uh, got uh, concession rights uh, in Colombia to exploit oil. This was a relatively small corporation that all of a sudden discovered uh, some of the most important oil fields in Colombia that still produce, uh, are, are st that, that, that are still producing, uh, producing oil. Uh, now, uh, something, something that uh, interesting happened here which was by the year of 1919, the Colombian legislation was relatively generous for Latin American standards towards multinational corporations. They were like, just come, not many, I mean, little taxation, uh, don't worry about the unions, um, um, yeah, royalties, whatever, uh, we'll take care of that later. 
1919, oil is discovered, and almost overnight, the Colombian government decides to change the existing legislation into something that was much more demanding for the foreign corporations. Of course, tropical oil didn't like this. They were like, okay, you invited us uh, with, a, with a generous legislation, and once we discover oil, you change the rules, and that is not, uh, that is not fair. And they protested uh, again, uh, uh, at the, um, um, in Washington. Now, of course, we're waiting for $25 million, and I'm changing the legislation here. So that is something that in the beginning looked like uh, something that uh, gave uh, uh, the people of tropical oil certain bargaining power. The Colombian government certainly responded by firing whoever wrote that legislation and changing the legislation back into, into not back, I mean, they, I mean, they, 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 they removed some of the most aggressive elements and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, made, and rewrote the legislation into something more similar to what existed before the year 1919. And this is a year in which the big guys of Standard Oil Company of New Jersey are also expanding abroad for th because of their own problems here, I mean, there in the United States. I mean, Standard Oil, as we know, used to belong to John Rockefeller, who built this huge empire called Standard Oil Company. And at some point, the US Supreme Court forced Rockefeller to divide Standard Oil into small, small, I mean, smaller uh, corporations uh, because he was not complying with the antitrust legislation. And one of these corporations was the Standard Oil of New Jersey. Now, Standard Oil of New Jersey was unlucky in the sense that in the division of the original Standard Oil, Standard Oil of New Jersey was left without many, it was left with refineries, but without many oil fields. So it was forced in a way, if it wanted uh, crude, to go abroad and start looking in other countries. And they went to Venezuela, they went to Peru, and they went to, to, uh, to, to Colombia here. And they acquired this smaller firm, the Tropical Oil Company. Now, let me go back to the map that I showed earlier. And um, we're talking about this area here. And of course, and this is the element that the Colombian government, as I will show later, will use as their, as their weapon here to, 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 ch to shift a little bit the, 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 the bargaining power, vis its bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the, the US and foreign corporations. The oil was produced here, but of course it needs to be taken out. And uh, for that, as we know, you need a pipeline. And this is where uh, we have the following situation. A corporation called the Andean Corporation had been created before in order to, 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 to transport the oil from the oil fields into the into I mean, into into to the refineries or to the or to the or to the ocean in, in case you wanted to to export it. Now uh, the thing here was the Colombian government told Standard Oil, okay, you acquired Tropical and you actually also acquired the Pipeline Corporation, but the concession we gave you was on the Production Corporation, not on the Pipeline Corporation. So you need some way to take this oil out. And, uh, and uh, so what are we going to do here? This is Standard Oil. OK, one second here. <clears throat> Andean Corporation is the one that, uh, that, uh, that uh, is going to transport this, uh, this, uh, this uh, oil. And uh, by the year of 1921, the Colombian government tells Standard Oil, look, we're not going to ratify any, any we're not going to, uh, uh, sorry, we're not going to sign any new oil agreements or contracts, sorry, with you until the Americans ratify, ratify the, Ur the Urrutia-Thompson Treaty. This means Standard Oil, you want the oil, you want, you, 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 you want the oil out. And uh, and uh, and that's uh, and that's uh, and that's that's fine. But that is another another concession. And in order for me to give you that concession, 
your government needs to pay me those $25 million for Panama. How are we going to do it? Then Standard Oil says, okay, I'll take care of this part. If you, I mean, I, I know, I, I know this is a, uh, this is a, uh, this is uh, 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 a difficult thing, but basically what the Colombian government managed to do here is to have Standard Oil becoming its lobbyist in Washington. So this is, I mean, Colombia is weaker than Standard Oil, but Standard Oil, I mean, Standard Oil already had the network uh, uh, already there in Washington to lobby the US Congress to finally ratify the, the, the Urrutia Thompson Treaty. So, okay, so this is like, you get the treaty, I'll give you the pipeline. But no treaty, no pipeline. This is kind of like uh, the, the, the way we're doing it. Of course, I mean, and Colombia could not play the tough guy here. I mean, they were aware that they were weak. So this is uh, the, the element of the pipeline was, uh, was, um, was the one that, uh, that was uh, that, that, uh, the only element that the Colombian government had here. So here we, I mean, there are different records in different uh, archives and actually in different uh, stories written on how the I mean, uh, the, 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 um, the, um, the big guys of uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey in Latin America were in Washington lobbying each congressman to ratify this, uh, this, uh, this treaty. Once the treaty is passed and the US Congress approves the $25 million, Standard Oil gets the approval to acquire Andean and therefore get the transportation to the to I mean get, get get the possibility of the transportation uh, of the transportation of oil. So okay, so here is the story of how those twenty five million dollars were paid. I'm using a multinational corporation in Washington, an American corporation in Washington, to lobby for those twenty five million dollars because they have something to gain here. Now, what we've been inquiring in this uh, in this um, in this research is okay and how did they do it because uh, it's not as easy as just going there and tell everybody hey i need the pipeline uh, why don't you give colombia 25 million dollars i mean this uh, the, the 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 whole political um, game here is uh, one of the elements that we've been studying because basically what this meant was uh, in a way, this is not the way it's mentioned in the literature, but this was a subsidy of the US government to Standard Oil. And uh, okay, how do you convince American senators to give, uh, to give money away to these foreign corporations so that they can get even richer exploiting oil abroad? Not only that, not only I am giving money to a big corporation, a big oil corporation, to produce oil abroad, but also this is a moment in which the United States did not need more oil. The US was exporting oil. So this was not, I mean, uh, all these things that were being said like uh, in the Iraq war or something. I mean, they were oil exporters. Actually having another player in the, in the world economy would have been bad news because more oil means lower prices. And if I'm an oil exporter, I in theory, I don't want that. So this is something that uh, that uh, that uh, that that shows uh, how delicate and complicated this could have been. I mean, give me. I mean, with taxpayers' money, give me money, and uh, so that I can I can do my businesses over there in Colombia. So the treaty was approved, and there are several several interpretations of why the Americans approved something that in theory they did not need to approve. I mean, who cares about tiny Colombia when you are an oil exporter in the, in the, uh, the, the US? So some explanations have been given. One, and one of the representatives of this is Stephen Randall, although there, there are more people uh, saying this, have said, some of them have said, look, there was simply a new political climate in the continent. Basically, by the 1920s, we have Wilson, 
And beforehand, we had Roosevelt. Roosevelt, the macho guy who just, I mean, the big stick, I mean, the, the image of the big stick just hitting the little, the little countries around. And uh, well, the, then came the, the idea, the, the, not ideology, the good neighbor um, um, era by which Washington, in theory, wanted to improve its relations uh, with uh, the rest of Latin America. And uh, basically, uh, people like Randall have said, it is because of this new era, this new political climate that uh, made some politicians say, okay, if we want to be serious about this good neighbor thing, well, let's pay Colombia its $25 million and uh, settle this and uh, now we're friends. Uh, there's another group of scholars, uh, um, one of the, representat uh, the represent representatives, I'm sorry, is uh, Taylor Lell, uh, who said, who have said, look, when you see what the Democrats and the Republicans were saying about the Panama Canal, you find two opposite views. You find, and this is true if you read the, the media of the time, the Democrats saying, look, I mean, if we, I mean, we don't want an empire. I mean, the Democrats were in theory saying empires, I mean, that's, that's the British, that's the French. I mean, we, we are a republic, we are different, and we obey international law, and uh, therefore, if we supported the separation of Panama from Colombia, then the best thing for us to do is to compensate the Colombians for this, for this loss. While, if you read the Republicans, the Republicans were more like, too bad. I mean, they lost, that's it. I mean, uh, why should we care about them? And actually, well, or I mean, they had more complex or more sophisticated ex uh, uh, um, arguments. They said, look, pain means that we're saying we regret doing something. And saying that we regret doing something is admitting that we did something wrong. And this generates a really bad precedent for American foreign policy that we intervene in a country and then we say, oh my God, no, this was the wrong thing to do. And some Republican senators said, no, America is a country that does the right thing always. I mean, we, we just not, we should not question that thing. So, Lel has said, okay, more Democrats started getting more, uh, more influence in the government and that led uh, the, 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 the that led the, 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 um, the government of the US to pay those $25 million. And uh, other authors have said, look, uh, especially yeah, Villegas and De La Pedraja, who are kind of like in the, in the left side of the political spectrum among the scholars that analyze this, have said, Colombia lost no matter what. Uh, on one hand, they gave, uh, they gave um, Panama to the Americans, and on the other hand, once they received those $25 million, they gave away the oil industry to the Americans again. And according to them, those $25 million were peanuts, and uh, because uh, the country could have become like a big uh, oil exporter. And uh, this, uh, this risk, I mean, the US, of course, wanted these $25 million to be paid because it uh, it um, it um, um, well it clarified the sovereignty. I mean, it, it made official the sovereignty of Panama as an independent nation, and uh, well, it could have the canal. Now my negotiations are with Panama. Let's forget about the the the, the Colombians, and uh, and uh, and in addition, we get our big corporation exploiting all the oil in Colombia. So basically this, uh, so yeah, we have like, okay, I mean, the American government is getting nicer, the Democrats are nicer, no, the Americans are evil, but, uh, and they won anyway because uh, this was the way to do things. Sorry, uh, uh, quick one, Jim. Um, you said you showed in a previous slide that 25 million at that time are around 10 billion today. Yeah. Do you have an estimate of what were the estimated revenues from the exploitation of the of the of the field? I mean, what what math was the standard oil company doing? Pay twenty five, and we and we want to get X 
What was the estimate? Yeah, I, I'm going to. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, I mean these are calculations that we've made and uh, they differ actually. And again, uh, as long as we continue, we will have to 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 come in. No, as long as we in the research continue, we will have we will have to see how how we differ with the de la Pedraja and um, and Villegas. So, okay, um, let's look at some of these explanations. Um, we found that the people that say the Democrats were not, I mean, that it's because uh, the difference between Republicans and Democrats, uh, they're basing themselves in whatever they said in the media. Okay, they went to the newspapers and said, we have to pay or not, too bad, let them, let them die or whatever. But uh, the one thing is what a politician says to the newspapers, especially in those times when, I mean, scrutiny was not as uh, down to the detail as it is now. And another one is how they actually voted in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Congress. What we see is, well, a detail that uh, the, the, the previous scholars I mentioned uh, did not take into account is that the Republicans were the majority in Congress anyway during the different periods in which the treaty was voted, the times in which it was rejected, and the times in which it was approved. So this is something that, uh, so we see Republican senators shifting sides uh, 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 as long as uh, time went by, which shows, of course, how successful Standard Oil was at approaching uh, different, uh, different, um, different politicians. And um, um, yeah, here we see, I mean, when the, when the, when the, when the treaty was uh, rejected, I mean, we see the Republicans uh, uh, being the majority of those opposing it, but the Republicans also being the majority of the, uh, I mean, um, uh, of those uh, supporting the treaty once it was uh, it was um, it was um, approved. So here, what we try to do is, okay, let's go into the states these senators came from and start trying to understand. What kind of uh, what kind of uh, interests uh, could have been present when deciding whether to vote for the treaty or not? And this is uh, what uh, we believe uh, is one of the hopefully will be one of the contributions because uh, we sometimes in order to understand why the empire behaves in a particular way abroad, you need to understand uh, what, what is going on within the empire and with their own uh, rivalries and interests existing in, uh, in, uh, uh, within, the, within the, um, the, the empire. So uh, here we would be assuming that uh, the senators that were coming from states uh, in which Standard Oil was strong, either by producing or by refining oil, should support the treaty. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, our our first um, our first uh, assumption here. Uh, now, here we have, and this is something that I mean. Uh, the more feedback I get, uh, the the I receive, the better. I mean, senators. This is again. This is a subsidy. So, if I'm a, a senator of a con of a of a state that is not producing oil. I might think, okay, if we give this $25 million to, to Colombia, again, that is, a, that, is a, that is a subsidy to Standard Oil. That means I cannot count with those $25 million in the future if one day I, I need them because, because they're gone. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, therefore, we would assume senators in other industries might be reluctant to approve something that means giving money away to industries that do not that are not present in my state because I want to bring money and uh, not give money away to others. And uh, uh, we would assume also that the senators of states in which the refining industry is strong should oppose the treaty because uh, the more, oh, I mean, Colombia entering the oil industry should uh, decrease the price of oil, and uh, that could uh, reflect in lower prices, uh, lower prices uh, of the of the products that they produce. On the other side, one can say, well, 
cheaper inputs as long as I don't decrease the or the, the price of whatever I sell uh, would be would be would be would be would, would be good for me and again uh, as I say as I mentioned before the United States was a net oil exporter so uh, so so the 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 I mean the consumers uh, would bear the opportunity cost of a subsidy given to an, a, a corporation that is going to expo exploit oil in another in another country. So we started going state by state and looking at what happened, and we found okay some clear opposition in some states, but the but the support uh, did not uh, bring initially very 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 clear results uh, we have those with clear opposition i mean with the two senators uh, uh, um, persistently voting against uh, the treaty minnesota washington and wisconsin that were mostly <coughs> consumers of oil but and, and among those supporting the treaty we have this bunch of states that i will, sh I, will I will talk about uh, some of them uh, in detail now uh, because uh, there is a big variance in terms of the economic uh, economic um, um, economic um, structure of the of the states that are we're talking about here i mean some of them are super industrial like massachusetts some others are super um, super rural uh, like uh, north dakota so what we found is at least the clear the clear support i mean uh, in this in this case i mean things were pretty straightforward the states in which standard oil was very strong were the ones that voted in favor of paying those $25 million, okay? One can imagine, Standard Oil is strong in my state, and I want to support it, and well, maybe they're giving me money, I mean, so, so it's even more important to, 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 to support it. But, uh, but the, the states, other oil important states in which Standard Oil was not important did not seem to did not necessarily support did not support the treaty basically here we can say okay other oil producing states like uh, california and, uh, and 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 kansas did not see any benefit of having these 25 million dollars diverting into the benefit of of standard oil if i i mean it's not some they didn't seem to see this $25 million as something that was good for the oil industry, but just was good for one corporation that uh, they were probably competing with, or they, or they, or they, or they didn't, uh, or they didn't want. Uh, now, uh, we have, for example, uh, some states that had, uh, that had, um, I mean, of course, all the states have a, a diversified economy and in different degrees. And uh, we have, this, uh, for example, the case of, uh, of uh, Wyoming, that is uh, both an oil state but also a cattle state, uh, supporting the supporting the treaty, even though uh, this was not a state in, in which uh, in which um, in which uh, United uh, Standard Oil was that powerful, and uh, it seems that states in which Standard Oil was not powerful but needed oil for manufacturing. They saw this as an opportunity. Probably we're still going deeper and deeper on this, but the intuition would say cheaper energy. I have factories. All right, bring I mean bring Colombia into the into the into the into the oil market because that might mean uh, that might mean um, that might mean um, yeah cheaper energy. I mean in the, in the input prices are not going to are, I mean yeah this is the, this is not uh, uh, getting I mean. Um, renouncing money that I could have used, but actually it's money that is good for my own industry. However, some states are using the money for, I mean, are important consumers in manufacturing, but others are important consumers in the very end of the, of the, of the industry, that is the final consumers. And uh, we see, again, that the states that did not have big factories and were not producing uh, oil 
but that at the same time we're promoting the use of motor vehicles and farming ma ma machinery did not seem to approve, I mean, did not approve the treaty. Now, why? I mean, this is cheaper oil for me. I mean, and, and for, for the people driving the cars. For this, in order to understand this, we started analyzing the structure of the oil industry. Okay, why, if oil is going to be cheaper, and I'm telling people, and I'm trying to promote car consumption, I, I, am I, am I, why am I going to oppose a treaty that might make oil cheaper? And this is because refineries were usually located in other states. And, uh, and this is something we're still um, digging, uh, but any suggestion here is welcome. Uh, they, and, um, and we've read it in the media anyway in those times, they didn't think that lower prices of oil were going to necessarily trickle down in the final consumer. They thought, yeah, the oil companies will make more money. I mean, we'll, we'll bring cheaper oil, but they will send us the gasoline. They will sell the gasoline at the same price or even more expensive. So we're not gaining anything. And we're renouncing to $25 million that I want in my state or I, 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 I want to use in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in something. Um, in, in something else. And these states in particular were very serious about building highways, building um, gas stations, and promoting the, I mean, these are huge states, I mean, with uh, farmers that live very far away from each other, and therefore the cars and trucks became something like a blessing for them, and they thought this is what we need, I mean, to promote in order to, to keep our economy going, but I'm not going to, uh, give away $25 million to give it to those guys who might actually increase the prices of what I am, of what I am uh, doing here. So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned beforehand, and as I'm uh, summarizing here, okay, the states with no oil services and in investing in car mobility, well, did not really seem, did not seem to trust that, uh, that prices were going to be lower for the final consumer. So we have all these interests around. And Colombia telling Standard Oil, get that done. Otherwise, you're not getting the pipeline. So we have, a, I mean, we can discuss in more detail, but I mean, the story I just, uh, I just, uh, I just mentioned uh, <coughs> here, uh, well, uh, we have the, the T statistics uh, for, for the, and whether the, the party affiliation made uh, uh, was important, it didn't uh, seem to be important, and the motor vehicle registration for, per capita that uh, seems to explain uh, uh, successfully why, uh, I mean, the states that did not um, support this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this treaty. I mean, we had to go, okay, who, okay, you're from Minnesota, you didn't approve the treaty, let's go to the economy of Minnesota, let's look at the number of cars that have been registered per year, and let's look at the role of the state at trying to promote this registration of, uh, of, uh, of cars per year. Same thing for the machinery, the use of uh, farm machinery. I mean, these states were really thinking, we're farmers, we need transportation and we need good uh, machinery, and uh, this treaty did not seem to, did not seem to, did not seem to, to, to attract them very much. Now, uh, so again, okay, I, I will come back again to the point of, so why, how, how did they manage to, to, to convince these people? And I hope I will not disappoint you guys by telling you at the end that uh, we're still trying to find the, the, the final answer. Um, so that might mean another invitation next year. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but in the meantime, OK, uh, who, were benef who were the ones benefiting from this subsidy? Of course, everybody says, well, of course, standard oil of New Jersey. I get the money. I get the pipeline. The Colombians give me the concession. Uh, uh, done, done, done deal. And actually, well, it seems, I mean, like the the activity of oil transportation was certainly more profitable than the actual oil extraction within Colombia. So, uh, well, these are graphs of the operational net earnings uh, per year in millions of dollars for the, for the, um, for the, this gray line is the production of oil. This is the, the, um, the transportation. Now this line finishes here and this one continues 
because by the 1950s, Colombia was still feeling the consequences of the whole Panama uh, reparations, etc. I think uh, because uh, in the year of uh, 1951, the concession given to Standard Oil expired, and Standard Oil gave all the facilities to the Colombian government. Um, this was supposedly, or they said, and yeah, it actually was a, a historical event, because Standard Oil said, look, this is the first time in history in which a multinational corporation gives its property to a government, not because of expropriation, but because the contract expired. And the guys of Standard Oil were telling the media, look, I mean, you see, we, we let's, let's, I mean, let's obey the contracts and, and we're, we'll, we'll obey them. I mean, we, you don't need to kick us out or to expropriate us or something. Look at the Colombian government. I mean, how civilized they are. And, and they have, sometimes they actually use the word civilized in the media. And, uh, but kind of like, yeah, there's rule of law in these countries while all the rest of the people just kick us out or expropriate us and stuff like that. And, uh, well, just to make, to show how folkloric the whole thing was, when the concession was uh, returned to the Colombian government, they were, I mean, they organized like folkloric dances and whatever, and uh, the national flag and uh, the guys of Standard Oil waving the Colombian flag and stuff like that. I mean, basically to show, look, I mean, we can, we can return properties. You don't need to take it away from us. But they didn't go, they didn't go, they, 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 they kept ownership of the pipeline which was actually the most profitable uh, part, of the, part of the business. So, um, so here, uh, what we see is, okay, we calculated the net present value of, um, of, uh, of both uh, the production site and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the transportation one. And uh, well, we calculated the net present value actually taken into account as a opportunity cost investing in the New York stock market. And uh, well, it basically, okay, the production didn't seem to have a, I mean, in the long term, it, uh, it, uh, it shows so far a negative uh, net present value, but uh, transportation certainly continued to be, to be good. And uh, this is, I mean, so, so basically, I mean, it, this, it, 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 this, it, it doesn't seem to look like Standard Oil really needed the, the subsidy, economically speaking, of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of, um, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the US government. Now to go very quickly here because uh, time is, uh, is uh, running out, uh, what I wanted to show is, okay, what about the US consumers? Uh, well, we um, did some calculations, I mean, taking into account uh, possible different degrees of, uh, of uh, uh, price elasticity of the demand of oil in the US. And uh, well, it seems, I mean, according to the different calculations here, that uh, no matter how inelastic or elastic the demand was, the American consumers saved with, I mean, those $25 million. So, I mean, it made sense for the American consumers as a whole to earn this, uh, to, to have the American government, uh, uh, re, uh, the, the American government helping um, Standard Oil. Now, that calculation is for consumers in general. Now, one thing is if you're a middle class person or a farmer with your truck, and another one is, is if you are a refiner, and that is, uh, that is something that we are still working on. So uh, again, I mentioned this is a work in progress, and that is why. And regarding the senators that changed their minds, since economically and politically speaking, things, uh, I mean, we have these uh, relatively clear things, uh, we started analyzing, okay, the biography of each one of these guys who were voting in each one of their states. Because, okay, it makes sense that I don't want to give away, to give away, to give away money that I could get, in, that I can bring home. So we've seen so far, we have not finished this because, I mean, it's te not tedious, it's, uh, it requires a lot of uh, detailed analysis, but so far it looks that some of the ones who shifted their votes ended up working for the oil industry later on when they were not senators anymore. 
and uh, but we need to bring. I mean, we need to be more precise in our in our in our study to eventually argue that uh, that this is what happened. So we have some preliminary conclusions and uh, that uh, we can discuss here. I mean, first, I mean, in general, uh, here we want to show the benefits of looking at what was going on within the empire to understand uh, to understand these kinds of. Uh, uh, action uh, in this in this uh, in, in this in this event. I mean, Colombia certainly managed to use to develop a strategy to get something for the loss of Panama. Did it compensate the loss of Panama? We're still working on that, but I guess and I'm, I mean, I'm open for ideas. It would mean to see, okay, the fry. I mean, the cost of uh, of uh, transportation. How much Panama actually earned? Uh, uh, could have earned here uh, because that's another story. Let's remember that Panama, the Panama Canal, belonged to the. I mean, the zone belonged to the, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the United States. And uh, well, there was not really for the whole country, for the country as a whole, the whole, the U.S. did not really need to pay these reparations. But uh, but uh, we're also thinking, okay, why didn't the Standard Oil pay that money instead of uh, going through this? Of course, it's better to get money for free, but the U.S. government could have told Standard, well, go and you pay that money instead of uh, instead of uh, making us uh, making us uh, uh, pay. So so far, it looks like uh, the Standard Oil managed to get some uh, degree of capture in the state. But uh, but we see what what we see is okay. There were certain economic interests playing an important role that uh, that uh, that are clear, and is, this is around uh, those states that were consuming oil for the final consumer, those states that were producing oil and uh, without Standard Oil, and those states that were producing oil with strong Standard Oil presence. That picture seems to be clear so far, and we're still. Uh, well, digging our sources and playing with the data and uh, not playing, um, engaging into serious uh, calculations. <laughs> and uh, and um, so this is the story so far. And uh, um, I welcome feedback, questions, ideas, suggestions, criticisms.